Hello and welcome to the Wharton Fintech podcast. I'm your host Tarun Gupta and our guest today is Kevin Green, the chairman and CEO of Tacit Group. Tacit provides blockchain-based real-time solutions to banks. And Kevin joined Tacit in 2017 and was named executive chairman in 2019. Previously, he served as the chairman and CEO of Capital Resource Holdings LLC and founded Bryant Park Capital. a privately held investment bank before this he was a senior consultant with mckinsey and company kevin earned a ba in economics from georgetown university a masters in public policy from harvard university and an mba from new york university join me as we explore what is a private permission blockchain focus on minimizing regret when making life decisions how blockchain is changing the banking industry why a successful business is 95% testing and execution and only 5% the idea kevin's proudest basketball moment and much more hope you enjoy the show hey kevin good evening good evening how are you and where are you calling us from new york city oh wow well how's the weather in new york today uh it's overcast but in the 40s so it's not bad same in philly same in philly <laughs> all right Let's let's dive into the questions. Could you start by sharing a bit about your career and what got you involved in fintech? Sure. So I started my career back in ancient history, as I call it, at graduate school at uh, McKinsey and Company in the financial services sector. Uh, right up old age of twenty nine, I decided to go out and start my own boutique investment bank. Still exists thirty years later, called Bryant Park Capital. Um, but I exited and did a roll up of pension consulting firms. Formerly a firm called CRA Rogers Casey, put together a number of companies and exited that in the early two thousands. We were advising six hundred billion dollars in institutional assets, and uh, did a couple of other projects. And then met a gentleman named Dennis Naden who built GE Capital and formed a family office for him. Within that, we've invested in a number of different companies, ranging from. Look at alternative mutual funds to shipping to uh, carbon capture companies, but our hearts lie in financial services. So um, the appearance of blockchain, in our view, uh, created a wonderful opportunity, created created ba- great uh, payments and financial services uh, company, and that's Tacit. So quickly, that's my background. Fascinating. One follow-on question, though. What inspired you to leave McKinsey and and pursue or start on your own? Because it's a pretty good job, right? You can't complain about that. Yeah, I had a great time there. I mean, uh, I I learned so much. The challenges, you know, everything was challenging. Um, really, at a very early age, you're solving major problems for major corporations. But uh, I was on partner track, and I had an idea of starting this boutique investment bank. And that's one of those crossroads in your life when you say. The way I put it is, by then I had two graduate degrees. I worked on Wall Street. I worked at McKinsey and Company, and um, really say to yourself, "Well, who are you really?" And I realized what really has always excited me is having a vision of something I want to create and organizing a group of people to create it. So I said to myself, "Would I regret not becoming a partner at McKinsey? No guarantees. See, so yeah, I probably would regret that. But would I regret at that point in my life going out and starting my own business and?" I decided I would regret that more. So I think a lot of decisions are about minimizing regret, and uh, so I minimized regret and did the thing that I would have regretted more if I hadn't done. <laughs> if, you, if you follow that logic, so makes uh, complete sense to me. Yeah, yeah, I've had a great time ever since. No, reg- no regrets. <laughs> All right. So talking about vision, let's talk about Tacit. What sure. was the inspiration behind it, and what what sure. is that you do? Yeah. So my partner and I and some other partners have a lot of experience in financial services. And when uh blockchain first came to our attention, really in the 2015-2016 time frame, at the end of the day it's just a very powerful database. That's really all it is. It's a very powerful way to capture and move data. And uh to us it was pretty straightforward that first of all that the IT infrastructure which has powered the world for 50 years 40 to 50 years was very antiquated 
very expensive to operate, monitor, upgrade, maintain. And that blockchain, we felt, solved a lot of those issues across the world. I mean, you're just going to see it in every industry. And in financial services, it seemed as though just an ideal way to run payments and other financial services um, securely, safely, securely, efficiently, and in a highly customized way. So immediately we saw just an opportunity to create a safer, more efficient, more secure, highly customizable payments and other financial services. To us, that's just, that's just one of those things that to us. You know what? That, that is so, uh, so cool because at that point in time, there was not a lot of, let's say, public attention on the use cases of blockchain. It was kind of like, okay, Bitcoin is rallying and then all the price fluctuations. But what, how did you go about educating yourself on this topic and, and, and sort of link it to, okay, this is a very good use case that I see for it? So first of all, for the last three decades, I've kind of done this over and over again, just seeing something that other people don't see. So what I always do is I figure there are a lot of people out there a lot smarter than me. So I go out and reach out to them and say, what do you think? And inevitably, they come up with better ideas than you had. So that's kind of where it first came from. Um, yeah, so I've never been, you know, I've never had a point of view on the price of Bitcoin ever. Uh, I still don't. But the power of the technology to me is is overwhelming. So just where could it be applied? And uh, I saw a way that corporations could transact business with each other instantaneously, securely around the clock. That's that was the genesis of uh, Tacit. It wasn't just me. I've got great investors and a great board, you know, very tight, high quality board, and we all we all saw the same thing. So Tacit uses uh, what is called a private permission blockchain, right? Correct. Can you break that down for us and then talk sure. to us about what that is? And also, sure. how did you go about building this? Like, how did you put together a team that will help you build this? So first, to answer the first question, the difference between public versus private. So everybody knows public blockchain, every transaction can be seen by anyone in the world around the clock at any, any point in time. Um, it's blockchain, but it's public. Um, private blockchain has all the power of blockchain, highly efficient database, highly secure, et cetera. However, it can only be seen by permissioned parties. So when you talk about uh, by the way, I think public blockchain is wonderful, creative. You can throw any idea out there. It can fall apart. It can stumble. It can get better. And lots of people can hack away at it. Um, when you're talking about banks, and you're talking about corporations and doing transactions. Um, again, it seemed obvious to us that banks and their corporations probably would not want all of their transactions to be visible to everybody around the, in the world, around the world at any point in time. So, uh, and in the U.S. banking system, so people, when it comes to public blockchain, say, wow, uh, you know, we can establish trust. Well, you know, when you're talking about banks, corporations, they're already trusted by their customers, they're already trusted by regulators. Who, you know, there's no need to establish trust. So don't waste your energy establishing trust, but use it, try to bring to bear the power of the blockchain. So private permission means what it says, only accessible to those who are permissioned to use it. And as a result, you end up with a more secure, uh, you know, equally efficient, but much more secure environment. And on top of that, the energy consumption is almost, almost non-existent, I mean, absolutely de minimis. So we don't have gas fees. We don't have to expend all that energy. We've estimated, in fact, that our private permission blockchain probably consumes less than 1% of what either proof of stake or uh, proof of work. Ours is proof of authority. So it's done internally. And sort of following on to the second part of that question, how did you put together the right talent to build this? So look, at the end of the day, and, and this is something I've done in every single business, I always figure that, you know, I might have an intuition about something, but the idea is go out and find the best possible talent you can. So we drew upon uh, people who primarily came out of the building exchanges and high frequency trading platforms. So when you think about technology, uh, you think about high people who do programming for high frequency trading is call that the formula, formula one of racing in terms of the talent that's required or Premier League and soccer. So we pulled people who had built um, FX all 
if you know them, LiquidNet. And a lot of Americans go through turnstiles and use Clear. So this team had built Clear. So we put together an absolutely all-star team that actually um, had no background in banking, no background in payments, and built the first platform that we built. And now we've been operating that. They built it in, in eight months up and running. And since inception, we've done over a trillion dollars in transactions. Now we're doing about $100 billion a month in transactions safely, securely, around the clock, no flaws. You know, I won't talk about how secure it is because then, uh, but it's highly secure. So what advantages do banks using tacit solutions get over banks using legacy systems, right? And then also sort of uh, uh, adding to that, how did you convince your first client or first bank to come on board? So uh, answer the first one. So right now, when you go to use a legacy payment, uh, system. Let's say I, you and I are both have accounts at the same bank and I want to send you $10,000. You have to give me all your, all your, uh, uh, you know, wiring instructions and everything else. I have to enter all that. There are a bunch of security safeguards. And then when I'm done, I hit send. Uh, but I have a problem. <laughs> if it's before nine in the morning or after about four in the afternoon, uh, I can't send the money. Got to wait until nine in the morning. I have to wait until the next day. And even when I send it, I don't know whether you've received it or not. So our system is you just give me your blockchain identifier. Uh, I go from and to. And in seconds, I know the money got sent. I know you received the money. I can do that at 8 p.m. on Thursday, 2 in the morning on Sunday. I can do it around the clock. On top of that, the existing payment systems that exist right now they only have to operate 40 hours a week. They all break down every single week, sometimes for five minutes, sometimes for five hours, sometimes for more than a day. We've operated for more than three years around the clock without a single instance of downtime, unplanned downtime. <clears throat> so highly secure legacy systems get hacked all the time. Fraud is really a problem. The estimate is for every dollar lost in fraud, four and a half dollars is spent preventing it investigating, remediating it. Fraud is very rare on our system. So instantaneous, around the clock, highly secure, always available. It's just a better solution. And the evidence of that is that when corporations start using our platform, you can imagine they don't go go to the bank and say, hey, could you slow me down again? doesn't happen. So really, really powerful uh, solution. The, the other thing I should mention is that once you have uh, created a digital environment for money, then you can do things like smart contracts, you know, program payment, timing of payment. So there's a lot you can do with an asset once you digitize it. That is so cool. But I, I need to ask this question. Do you see uh, like incumbent banks trying to provide this solution on their own? Uh, is that uh, sort of a possibility? Sure. Yeah, I, I very little doubt. The largest banks will try to figure out how to do this on their own. Uh, we're out there to serve the, there are 4,000 banks in America. There are probably about 10 that will figure out how to do this on their own, but we're out there to serve the other 3,990, uh, who really, we got a 90 person team, best, te- best technologist in the world. Your typical bank probably can't attract that talent. And most banks don't have the scale to do this. And let's dive deeper into the business model, right? How do you earn revenue? Is it a subscription SaaS model or is it more of a one-time onboarding fee? And also, what is a major cost center? So it's a uh, subscription fee, uh, but we say as a certain number of transactions. And then after transaction volumes hit a certain level, then an a individual transaction fee kicks in. While the uh, assets are in digital form, there are also interest-free deposits for the bank. So we actually charge basis points on those interest-free deposits. So it's really, it's a SaaS model, but transaction-driven and volume-driven. So as the beauty of it is that as our customers use our platform more, their interest-free deposits grow and our, and our revenues grow along with them. So it's very much partnering with our clients. So, uh, so that's the overall model. The costs for us are, uh, I mean, the, the, uh, the gross margin on our, on our business is, uh, there are some processing fees that we incur, but still a gross margin is, you know, 85, 90%. And then we have a fixed base, obviously, 
high customer service and, and we're always developing, we're always adding, adding to our business. But uh, at scale, our business model is a 35% EBITDA margin type business, highly profitable at scale. That seems something like a VC would be super interested in. So my next question is, since 2017 till now, right, what kind of a growth trajectory have you seen and what have you raised any funding and, and sure. what's your plan for the next five years or so? So I can tell you the best way to measure our growth has been just year by year, the uh, volume of transactions that we've done. So going back to uh, 2020, we did $48 billion in transactions. In 21, we did $247 billion. Last year, we did $538 billion. And the first two months of this year, we have done almost $300 billion, so about $278 billion. So uh, we're, on, we're on a pace to do more than a trillion this year, so we will more than double what we did last year. So we had very rapid growth. We keep auditing banks. You know, the beauty, I've just talked about Passive Pay, which is our core payment platform within a bank, so for two customers of a bank. We also introduced on October 1st the same real-time payment mechanism, but across banks. It's called the Digital Interbank Network. Launched that on October 1st of last year. On a Saturday, we always launch our products on the weekends to show that they can operate over a weekend. First day of operation, we did $500 million in transactions. So that's the second level. And as I mentioned, the third level is smart contracts. So think about that as programmable money. Very important to what we do. Everything's private permission, highly secure. Everything operates within existing U.S. banking regulations. So we do everything within existing U.S. banking regulations. So we call that a regulatory perimeter. So private permission within the regulatory perimeter. The, the third or fourth P is proven. We've done over a trillion dollars in transactions. So we're big believers in doing things the right way with an existing infrastructure. Uh, we're not uh, we're not big believers in blowing everything up. My next question might be of special interest for our listeners. Is Tacit hiring? If yes, I mean, you touched upon this briefly, but what, what are you looking for people in your team? So we are big believers in hiring for talent and character. We can teach you the skills. Now, obviously, we do hire for specific skills. But uh, what I've been very proud of throughout my career, it's all about building great teams and getting them to play well together. So we look for outstanding talent, outstanding integrity, real team players. Um, my message to people is always, uh, if you want to be mediocre, there are millions of companies to work for. If you really want to stand out. You want to be unusual. You want to be outstanding and really enjoy what you're doing. I think there are actually really a handful of companies to work for. And companies I lead, I always try to put them in that category. And, and TAS is definitely that way. We have 90 employees. They're all highly motivated, love what they're doing every day, super creative, super high integrity. And we just set goals and we achieve them. And that's an uncomfortable environment. Probably we're not the right place. So we're easy to find here, tacit.com. You know, many are called, but few are chosen. Switching over to the next segment of the episode. So my first question is, what major challenges do you see in widespread adoption for, of blockchain within financial services, right? Is it the regulatory uncertainty? Is it the lack of understanding of technology? Or is just the fact that banks are resistant to change? You hit all three of them. I mean, banks uh, done properly, a bank executive is all about, man he or she is all about managing risk, right? So they should be thinking about downside. They should be concerned. So they are fundamentally resistant to change. However, if you look at it, you know, banking has always been driven by technology. It's always been driven by technology. So they might be slow to adapt, uh, but they eventually get there. Uh, this is new technology. Funnily enough, it's so powerful. That's what, that's what kind of makes it intimidating. It is highly secure. It's highly efficient. Now, the way we're overcoming that is, uh, you know, when we empower banks, it's one of the little story I tell, you know, the people in technology think all the creativity exists in Silicon Valley. We've proven is that we equip our banks with this tool. Their creativity is impressive because they own the client relationship. They know what the client needs are. We give them a new way of addressing it. So we've got over 20 use cases that we've got that we developed for banks literally just in the last 12 months. So they are very creative when it, when it comes to this. Um, 
really, really powerful, very, very impressive, uh, but takes a little bit of time. I think it's inevitable because this technology is changing everything in the world, and they're aware of that. Last but not least, regulatory uncertainty. Um, that is probably the biggest concern. What's happened in the crypto space has not been helpful. We've always said, I've said this since day one, while we've done work that supports U.S. dollar settlement of cryptocurrencies, none of our banks has ever owned a cryptocurrency, but we do the U.S. dollar settlement part of it. But I've always been interested in the other 99.9% of the U.S. economy. And so I think regulators actually are doing a good job. It was all new to them as well, right? They're doing a good job getting their hands around it. Uh, they have to be careful not to eliminate the creativity. Um, and by the way, they've confirmed our view because they've come out and said that they really think private permission blockchain is the way to go when it comes to blockchain. That's a real positive step. There were a lot of excesses. We read the newspaper every day, really terrible excesses. Ironically, none of those excesses had anything to do with the technology, everything to do with people not being regulated, people trying to hide things deliberately. So it had nothing to do with the technology. There's no flaw in the technology. Uh, you know, take Bitcoin. It still exists. It's still trading every day. It didn't blow up. Well, what happened was people were trying to do things outside of regulations. They were trying to conceal things. And uh, our view has always been private permission operating with the existing regulations. And if you do that, this is very powerful technology. And I'm, I'm very encouraged. I think the regulators are getting to the right place in all of this. What are some areas within fintech that you think are prime for disruption, especially when you talk about uh, blockchain adoption or implementation? So like overall, on, on overall level, do you look at lending or payments or, or something of that sort that is like blockchain should revolutionize that? Everything. I can't think of anything that shouldn't be disrupted. I should have said, you know, we're very focused on, on the B2B segment, the corporate segment. It's interesting. Um, you know, it's 10 times large as the consumer. So it's a much bigger market. Uh, still more than 50% believe all B2B payments are used, done using paper checks. You can believe that. Okay. Yet there are very few competitors in the space because the, because the, uh, performance requirements are so high. Okay. When you're doing something retail, you can afford to make a mistake because mistakes are really small, right? You can always fix it later. We're doing million-dollar transactions. You cannot make a mistake, right? So there are very few competitors who can get in that space. But the way I describe it is that uh, you know the CFO of a major corporation goes home and uses PayPal or Venmo and does everything around the clock instantaneously. Then he goes to the office, he or she, she goes to the office and tries to send a million-dollar payment has to wait three days. Okay. That can't last forever. So in, in our view, um, I just, uh, you name it, we're looking at lending, we're looking at logistics, we're looking at just working capital management across the board. Everything is going to, we think everything is ultimately going to ride on the blockchain. It's all going to be instantaneous. It's all going to be highly customized. So we haven't found an area yet that we can't disrupt and that the banks can't. And again, the banks will disrupt it. I really don't think uh, three people in a garage somewhere are going to disrupt it. But when do you think that's going to happen? When do you think the incentive will be strong enough for the banks to finally take the step and go ahead with this? Well, we're seeing it happen already. I'll tell you, a little bit more than 12 months ago, when I would speak to a bank CEO, I have to explain what blockchain is. Okay, um, now they're talking, now they know what blockchain is and they're trying to, they're, they really, the evolution they want was, okay, I know what it is, tell me about use case. And now they say, I know what it is, I know I need a strategy, help me figure out a strategy. So they're already there. Uh, I think you're going to see it really accelerate over the next uh, few years. It's going to move through real fast. The time is right. For my last segment, what I'd like, what I'd like to do is introduce you more as a person to our listeners. So my first question <laughs> for you is, what is the fun fact about you most people don't know? Well, uh, let me see. Uh, one of the things I'm proudest of, and I've told this to many people, so uh, I don't look like a guy who's very good at basketball, but there's a Hall of Famer named Walt Frazier. Just before I turned 40 years old, I played him one-on-one and beat him. <laughs> well, sh- shock to him and a shock to me, so I was pretty proud of that. Most people I, wouldn't, wouldn't know that looking at me. 
I guess Mackenzie's gain was NBA's loss. Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about that. It wasn't that good. What advice would you give to someone who understands that blockchain is, is the future, right? But doesn't know how to build a career that aligns them to this evolution. It comes with uh, just how do you build a business. So the first one is um, uh, you've got to have a vision of something you want to create. Uh, that's actually the easiest part. The hard part is figuring out how to go from my idea to putting it into action. And that just requires um, a lot of vision, a lot of stick to um, You know, when I was younger, I thought it was the great idea that mattered. As I started to make all the mistakes in the world and lose money at it and everything else, I realized that the great idea is at best 5%, at best. It's the other 95% that really is take that great idea, test the market with it, make changes, make adjustments. And it's not easy. That's the hard part. And you know, organizing some great talent, keeping them focused, but making all the mistakes, make them fast, you know, the, you know, make the mistakes fast, adjust and stick with it. You know, it's really, really hard. It's not easy. I'd, uh, I'd have them think twice before they go through it. I think this is a perfect segue to the next question. If you could go back in time, is there anything you would do differently? Oh, I think uh, learn all the lessons faster. You know, when I, uh, when I turned 40, I said, gee, I've figured everything out. I know everything. I've really seen, I, not quite I know everything. I've seen a lot. I've kind of figured it all out. The next uh, 18 months, I learned more than I had lo- learned in the prior 40 years. And uh, I'm a little bit older than that now. And I still wake up every day and go, what an idiot I am. I mean, I mean, it's just like, why did it take me this long to figure all this stuff out? So if I could do it over again, I'd just learn everything faster. But the question is, how do you learn something faster? You know, I don't know. Just get lucky. We are limited by our imagination and our talents. Um, but, but really, what's really important is just go out there and fail. I view the world that, uh, you know, 70% of the people never try anything that leads to failure. Those who do fail, another 25 percentage points, never kind of they quit at that point. And it's a handful of people. And I'm not saying this to brag at all, but it's, you know, 90 people in my organization feel the same way. They go out there, they fail. They just get up, fail again. Now, you don't fail deliberately. Let me be clear about that. But you just, you're willing to take, take risks. You're willing to try things, you're willing to learn. You know, a really important thing is really learning, listening hard paying attention, learning from others, you know, just, just how do yeah. How do you learn faster? Just do more quicker and learn faster. Right. Really, really important. I guarantee Einstein made a lot of mistakes. Okay. He just tried a lot of things. Trust me. He just tried, he just had a computer that could try a lot of things real fast so that the result was outstanding, but uh, don't kid yourself. He failed many, 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 many times. That's why he, came up with the E equals MC squared. On that note, I'll let you get back to work, Kevin. But thank you so much for being on the episode. Love the conversation. Hopefully it was helpful. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Walt in Fintech podcast. If you like the show, then please show us some love on social media or consider leaving a review. It means a lot to us and helps spread the word to more listeners. If you want more content from our fintech community, please subscribe to our podcast and find us on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, and Medium at Wharton Fintech. There you will find interviews, articles, videos, and much more analyzing all aspects of the industry. As always, special thanks to our editor, Rafael Osteria. Signing off until next time, I'm your host, Tarang Gupta. Gupta.